Today we are talking about vector <coughs> We are talking about vector databases. All right, I think this is a really fun subject because these are tools that are fantastic at cataloging how different pieces of data are related to each other. There's going to be a lot of hand motions as per usual. But before we talk about vector databases, we first need to understand what a vector is. are arrays of numbers. And when those arrays represent something, we call them embeddings. The term vector really just refers to the mathematical concept, whereas embedding is, is kind of like a, an applied vector, if you will. So what do these embeddings represent? Uh, well, technically anything you want, but because it's very common to use vector databases for natural language processing and semantic search, today I'm going to be talking about embeddings that represent words. Oh, wait, I need my book. So to illustrate how this works, I'm going to be stealing an example from this book, Deep Learning, A Visual Approach by Andrew Glasner. Highly recommend. But I just really like this example because it's, uh, it's very fun and goofy and it gets the point across very well. Suppose you are an animal wrangler on a movie set. And right now you're filming a scary scene where the main character is being chased by an animal. So you call up your office for, you know, a collection of, of options here, and they send you a graph with a bunch of different animals. But the problem is they've left out the X and the Y axis labels. So you just get this like weird plotted graph of animals. Why did the office send it to you in the form of a graph? We'll never know. Don't worry about it. Anyways, the director says, uh, let's try horses. So we get out the horses and put them in the scene, try them out, and the director goes, cut! These horses are too twitchy. They're too quick. I need horses that are less fox-like. What does that even mean? Doesn't matter, because we can figure it out. So if we were to represent this request as a weird animal math formula, it might look like horse minus fox equals our new animal. So let's take a look at our graph. To get to horse, we take this path. To get to fox, we take this path. So if what we want is horse minus fox, we can think of this as a set of directions. So first we go in the horse direction. Then we go in the opposite direction of fox. Again, we want horses that are less fox-like, so we're gonna, we're gonna flip it and reverse it. So where does that take us? Giant sloth. Whatever, it's what the director wants. So we give them a giant sloth, but the director's like, no, 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 these giant sloths are too slow. Give me a sloth that's more like a roadrunner. Uh, okay. So let's update our weird animal math to be horse minus fox plus roadrunner equals our new animal. So we go in the direction of horse, then the opposite direction of fox, then in the direction of roadrunner. And that takes us to grizzly bear. And that's how they made the revenant. Now these animals, you could say, live at specific coordinates, right? And so if we were to assume that the X and Y axis are speed and weight, our bear might live at like, I don't know, 0 0.4 comma 0 0.8. What are these units? Don't worry about it. Speed and weight are features of any given animal, wouldn't you say? But in machine learning, features have another name. They're called dimensions. That's why these coordinates that represent these animals, we would call these a two-dimensional embedding. Dimensions are really just like little dials you can fiddle with, all right, that represent data. And typically, embeddings have a lot more than two dimensions, often hundreds. Now, here's the thing. In our movie example, it's pretty easy to take a look at this graph and see that the x-axis is probably speed and the y-axis is probably weight. But it's way more common to not know what these dimensions represent at all. In fact, sometimes machines will come up with connections that we never would have thought of, all right? It's kind of like computer synesthesia. But when we leave it up to the machines to figure out what these dimensions should represent, they can come up with some really clever relationships between data points. So just to recap, embeddings are arrays of numbers that represent some data, right? Based on however many dimensions. But what does that have to do with a vector database? Vector databases are just collections of embeddings, and these are organized into indexes, all right? An index is kind of like, like a table, right? So a collection of rows of embeddings, and we call those records. And that's kind of it. 
Okay, bye. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's talk about how these databases are used. Some of you may have heard of RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. And I have a whole video on this, but I'm gonna explain it very briefly. If you want to use an LLM to answer questions about data it wasn't trained on, you can use the RAG pattern to supplement it with extra data. Let's say you have a bunch of support docs. So these would get turned into embeddings and stored in a vector database. Then when the user types in a prompt, that prompt gets turned into embedding, which is used to search the vector database for similar information. Now, remember that animal math that we had before? With RAG, you're not actually doing this, all right? What you're doing is a similarity search. Basically, you're just looking for the nearest neighbors to the embedding that you give the database. As silly as our animal math example was, that type of vector algebra is actually part of a broader class of operations that are used in typically much more complex vector database situations. For example, AlphaFold by DeepMind has revolutionized protein structure prediction by using deep learning to predict 3D protein structures from amino acid sequences. So scientists can query this database of protein structure embeddings, right? To find structurally similar proteins, even when the sequences differ a lot. What I'm trying to say here is that vector databases are not created equal, all right? The database that they use for AlphaFold it's gonna be a bit more complex than what you would use in a typical RAG application. So by now, you should have a pretty good understanding of what vector databases are and why they're so powerful. I have been covering a lot of AI and machine learning related topics in my videos, uh, partially because, you know, AI has taken the tech world by storm for better or for worse, but I really enjoy demystifying these subjects. I have a lot of videos planned that uh, I'm very excited about, but if there are subjects that you would like to see me cover, let me know in the comments section down below. With that being said, thank you all so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.